Welcome everyone to the Cancer Research Institute's webinar series, Cancer Immunotherapy and You. Today's date is Wednesday, November 16th, 2016. The title for today's webinar is Lung Cancer, What Patients Need to Know About Immunotherapy. <clears throat> November is Lung Cancer Awareness Month, and we're pleased to offer today's webinar, which will address some of the promising recent developments in treating lung cancer patients with immunotherapy. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors. This webinar is made possible with generous support from Genentech and LabAnswer and its employees, along with additional support from AbbVie, Celdex, NewLink Genetics, and Regeneron. My name is Brian Brewer, and I'm Director of Marketing and Communications at the Cancer Research Institute. Cancer Research Institute is a nonprofit organization devoted exclusively to saving more lives through research that aims to harness the immune system's innate ability to fight cancer. We fund scientists all around the world whose work has led to significant breakthroughs in cancer immunotherapy research and treatments. Over the next 45 minutes, you'll hear from an immunotherapy expert how cancer treatment is undergoing a revolution thanks to these breakthroughs, followed by a question and answer period. You can type your questions in the Q&A box on your screen at any point during today's webinar, and I hope to get to as many questions as possible toward the end. Now it's my pleasure to welcome today's expert speaker. Dr. Lena Gandhi is the Director of Thoracic Medical Oncology at New York University's Langone Medical Center and an Associate Professor of Medicine at NYU's Laura and Isaac Perlmutter Cancer Center. She is also a member of the Cancer Research Institute and Ludwig Cancer Research Clinical Trials Network. Dr. Gandhi's work focuses largely on treating lung cancer patients with a promising type of immunotherapy called checkpoint inhibitors. Her work is, as a lead investigator on a pivotal phase one clinical trial has helped to demonstrate the usefulness of a specific biomarker that may predict patient responses in patients treated with immunotherapy. Her ongoing research involves evaluating the impact of other therapies such as chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and radiation therapy on the tumor microenvironment to better understand how to optimize patient responses to treat with treatment with immunotherapy. Dr. Gandhi, we're grateful that you could take time out of your day to join us. It's always good to see you. Welcome. Thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit today um, about lung cancer immunotherapies and what we have seen happen in the past few years, which has been really exciting and changed a lot of how we treat lung cancer, but also where we hope to go in the future. And to start, um, I wanted to just introduce really the scope of the problem, which many of you may be familiar with, but lung cancer is the number one cause of cancer death in both men and women in North America, and over 200,000 people are estimated to be diagnosed in 2016 with 158,000 estimated deaths. Um, that's based on older data. We hope that number is going to be changing rapidly with the developments that we're seeing in immunotherapy. Um, but those numbers will be still to come. We know that part of the problem in treating lung cancer is that more than 75% of lung cancer is diagnosed when it's already advanced beyond the time where we can um, cure it with surgery alone. And uh, over half of lung cancers are diagnosed when they really can't be cured at all. And often in those cases, or traditionally in those cases, the standard of care is treating with chemotherapy, which can control cancer growth um, for a time, but usually has relatively small benefit and significant side effects. Um, another growing problem in lung cancer in the United States is that 47% of new diagnoses are women. And amongst women, the percentage of lung cancers that happen in non-smokers is higher than it is in men. So that may be a separate and emerging problem that we need to deal with as well. Um, you know, when we think about immunotherapy and lung cancer, it's not a new um, field that's never been thought about before. In fact, we've been thinking about it ever since we tried starting treatments for cancer. We know that our immune system really functions to get rid of abnormal cells in your body, to get rid of infections, things that shouldn't be there, but also things that have gone awry. Um, and it's quite likely that immune surveillance or immune cells circulating throughout our bodies actually um, are constantly getting rid of and scavenging cells that shouldn't be there. However, when there are established cancers, and especially in the setting of metastatic cancer, 
it can be much harder for the immune system to really get rid of those cells. And it's not been 100% clear why, although it seems that a lot of it is related to the fact that cancers grow out of our own body cells, so therefore they can subvert the normal processes that your body uses to maintain checks and balances on growth of cells. And that includes um, sort of co-opting um, the mechanisms of inflammation, the mechanisms of immune response to actually allow for cancer growth. And in fact, um, we know that um, some of the ways that uh, cancers can grow is that they actually can suppress immune responses, especially in the environment around the tumor. And it was thought that actually in lung cancer, that this is particularly a place where immunotherapies may not be as effective because lung cancers were not thought to be, quote, immunogenic, meaning recognized for attack by the immune system. Well, the development of PD-1 inhibitors and PD-L1 inhibitors have really changed that paradigm because for the first time we're seeing immunotherapies that actually can be very effective at controlling individual patients' cancers, and sometimes for very, very long periods of time. In fact, for some patients, we actually have seen that their cancers have remained under control for years, and we don't really know how long that can remain the case. Um, so it's really changed how we think about the potential for <clears throat> immunotherapy in lung cancer. And when I talk about immunotherapy, I think of it in two different kinds of immunotherapies. And one is what we would call active immunotherapy, which are drugs that can stimulate an immune response against tumors. And this could include um, cytokines or things like interferon, which can basically stimulate immune cells to do their job. And there's also the concept of passive immunotherapy, which basically blocks inhibition of immune responses. Um, so we always normally regulate our immune responses. When you get a cut, you have a very significant inflammatory response to try to heal that cut. And then as the cut heals, <clears throat> your body actually self-regulates that response to turn off the inflammation and to quiet down. And I think we, the more we understand about tumor interactions in our body, we know that the tumors often co-opt those uh, mechanisms to quiet down or tamp down immune responses, especially right around the tumor, which we call the tumor microenvironment. Um, <clears throat> PD-1 inhibitors are a type of passive immunotherapy, if you will, because really what they're blocking is an interaction that happens um, in the tumor immune microenvironment between T cells and dendritic cells, which are other types of immune cells that normally uh, regulate T cell responses. And that can also happen between tumor cells and T cells, because what we now know is that both dendritic cells and tumor cells can both express a protein called PDL1 which is a protein that binds this receptor called PD-1 on immune cells and tells the immune cells to turn off. So it's the tumor's way, or one of the tumor's ways of basically evading a normal immune response to sort of basically shut off a normal T cell attack um, that might otherwise kill the cancer cell. And um, many cancers can express high levels of PD-L1 on their cell surface. And it is thought, actually, the more we understand about how PD-1 inhibitors work, especially in lung cancer, that high levels of PD-L1 um, on the tumor cells can be uh, a marker for the chance of benefit of those types of therapies. <clears throat> so the top panel, just to sort of show you the top panel here, um, let's try to use a pointer. Um, the top panel here sort of shows you um, uh, how immune cells get inactivated. So uh, PD-L1 expressed on the tumor cell surface or a dendritic cell that would be trying to tamp down the immune response would bind um, this protein to this receptor on the T cells and sort of turn them off. Now, when we come in and use um, PD-1 inhibitors or drugs that can block that interaction, such as nivolumab, pembrolizumab, and newer drugs such as atezolizumab, which is, sorry, this um, number here, MPDL is an older name for that, or durvalumab, um, the, which is a drug that's still not approved, but also in clinical trials. These can block either the um, PDL1, so they basically bind to the PDL1, or these drugs uh, bind to the PDL, uh, PD1 receptor on the immune cells. And either way, they sort of interfere with that interaction and allow the T cells become activated and 
Specifically, they allow for activation of killer T cells to then attack and kill cancer cells, um, which is the ultimate goal of harnessing your immune system to attack cancer. So what do we know at this point in time about PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors in non-small cell lung cancer, which is the most common type of lung cancer? Well, we know that they can cause significant shrinkage of cancers and tumors uh, in about 20% of patients overall. Um, but in patients who, um, who have high levels of PD-L1 expression, that benefit can be, uh, that the chance of benefit can be much higher. And for those who do get benefit, meaning they have some shrinkage of the tumors, that can be really long-term for some patients. There are now three drugs approved for treatment of lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, that are PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors. All are approved in the second line, meaning if patients have had prior chemotherapy that has stopped working or didn't work initially, um, both uh, Keytruda or Pembrolizumab, Opdivo or uh, Nivolumab have been approved for now <clears throat> over the last year for treatment in the second line. Just in the last month, there was a third approval of a PD-L1 inhibitor called a tezolizumab or Tecentric, um, and all three are now approved in the second line as uh, drugs which are superior or more effective than st standard second line chemotherapies at keeping cancer under control for a longer period of time. What's really been most exciting in the last month is that um, for a subset of patients with very high levels of expression of PDL1, basically more than 50% of the tumor cells expressing PDL1 on the cell surface, uh, one of those drugs, pembrolizumab, was shown to be significantly better than first line chemotherapy at both shrinking uh, tumors, controlling cancer cell growth, and keeping the cancer under control for a longer period of time. So, that drug, pembrolizumab, is now approved as a first line treatment of choice. Uh, for patients who have high levels of PDL1 expression. And this has really changed actually how we treat lung cancer patients, even from the very beginning when we first um, are trying to address treatment of cancer and keep cancer under control. It, it's really replacing chemotherapy for a subset of patients. And this has been in a really important advance because in many settings, we consider these therapies to be less toxic overall than chemotherapy although they do have rare, but sometimes very serious side effects. <clears throat> so this is an older slide comparing some of these drugs that I mentioned, nivolumab and atezolizumab, to some standard second-line chemotherapy regimens over here, um, docetaxel plus ramucirumab or docetaxel plus nintedinib. Um, these drugs, as you can see, um, can have very high levels of uh, adverse events, or AEs as we call them in clinical trials, with over 90% of patients experiencing some adverse effects from the therapy or associated with getting the therapy. On the, on the other hand, all of these um, uh, PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors have lower rates of adverse effects overall. And specifically, when we look at really serious adverse effects, those that actually cause a lot of symptoms or sometimes even result in hospitalization, those really the rates are quite low with the PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors relative to chemotherapy, which can still be quite high overall. Um, there are side effects of these drugs, don't get me wrong, and those do sometimes lead us to discontinue the drugs overall. But still, again, compared to chemotherapy, we think of these overall as more tolerable drugs. That's not, again, to say that they're without side effects. Some of the side effects associated with these drugs can be life-threatening. And more importantly, some of them can lead to irreversible autoimmune problems. So when we use these drugs, what we're really doing is revving up your immune system to attack the cancer. But that can result in autoimmune problems um, that can be sort of overactive immune systems or overactive inflammatory problems that can really affect almost any organ. And it's hard to predict who may um, uh, suffer from those kinds of serious adverse effects. So we still don't have a good way to know who's going to benefit and who's also not going to have side effects. Um, you know, that's important because these drugs really don't work for everybody. Uh, you know, they, they overall, again, they only work for about 20% of non-small cell lung cancer patients. And for many of them, where they do work, the effects are still not permanent. So for many patients, even if they get benefit, over time, patients can develop resistance to these therapies as well, just as they can to chemotherapy. So there's still a lot of work to do, I think, to really maximize benefit and minimize harm. Uh, this gives you an example. This is a patient of mine 
who was treated with um, nivolumab very early on in the, in the course of these clinical trials. And one of the difficult things is that for patients with lung cancer, this is a CT scan showing um, this patient's lungs. So just to sort of orient you, gray here is, um, uh, this is sort of like a cross-sectional view of the lungs. Um, uh, and the gray is sort of soft tissue around the lungs. The very white areas are the bone. So these are the ribs around the lungs. This is the heart in the center with blood vessels coming out of it. And these are the two lungs. And we're actually here looking at right and left lung. And you can see these little gray spots are not normal. Um, this is a more normal appearance of the lung right here. This area was just like really, really tiny spots, which are blood vessels. And these all represent cancer growth uh, within the lung. And that can be a problem if you do develop an immune toxicity. So this patient actually shortly after starting an immunotherapy developed severely worsened shortness of breath. And when we got another scan, there was a lot worse of this whitishness of this basically um, consolidation within the lungs, which is really a result of inflammation as a result of the immunotherapy that made her very sick um, and resulted her in her being hospitalized, treated with high dose steroids and high-dose oxygen, none of which really helped her. And then we were able to give, you her, give her another immune modulator. And you can see that this scan here, this lung compared to here, there's a lot more clearing of this inflammation. And we were able to improve things so that she could go home from the hospital. But it's a real risk, particularly with lung cancer patients where we're already dealing with side effects that are happening as a result of the cancer in the lung. So we really don't want to cause harm on top of that with therapies. Um, and that's why I think we really try to focus on what are the biomarkers or markers of who's really more likely to respond or not. And one of the markers that has been used in clinical trials from the very beginning is PDL1, which we know can be expressed on uh, tumor cells at variable levels. Now, the problem is, is that you know, when we try to sort of calculate who, who has this and who doesn't, um, it, it's a little hard to pin down, partly because different companies that have evaluated this in clinical trials have used different assays. So the range of expression has been reported to be as low as 25% to as high as 70 or 80%. Um, the other problem is that we know that PDL1 is a dynamic biomarker, meaning unlike a genetic change in cancer cells, which is usually a fixed change that doesn't change over time or with exposure to other therapies, PDL1 expression can change with exposure to other therapies or with changes in the microenvironment around the tumor that might affect whether it's expressed at high levels or not. This is an example, actually, of one of the assays used to stain for PDL1 from Merck, um, which is also the company that developed pembrolizumab, where there's now been a really uh, more clear cut association with high levels of expression and the benefit of therapy with pembrolizumab. And you can see that, you know, when we just call something positive, that doesn't necessarily mean very much. This, these cells over here, which are all blue, um, don't have any brown staining for PDL1, and so they would be considered negative. But every one of these other ones are considered theoretically positive. And that's what we now have to sort of narrow down what we mean by positive. So positive at a 1% level, or very faint or minimal staining, is different than staining at a very high level, which means that most of the cells, most of the tumor cells in the area are staining with this brown stain, PDL1. These are the cancers that have a high likelihood of response. But honestly, these cancers really have quite variable chance of response and really quite low on the order of, of maybe 5 to 15 percent at most. So um, while this can be maybe a good positive predictive value, meaning we can sort of when there's a lot of um, PDL1, that can be a good um, high chance of benefit. When there's no PDL1, that's a little less certain about what's really likely to happen or not. And we don't want to exclude patients that can benefit. So it, it sometimes can be challenging to use PDL1 to sort of choose patients only on that basis, whether that would be a good option or not. This is sort of another way of depicting this is from this early phase one trial, which showed that patients who have really high levels of expression stand out from all the others. They have a much higher chance of response on the order of close to 50%, whereas patients who have sort of intermediate expression, anywhere from zero to 50%, are pretty much like those who have, have no percent, no, um, expression. They, they both can have some low level chance of response. It's not really high, but it's not zero either. So it has really moved us to try to look and better understand why isn't this such a good marker? Are there other ones that are better? Or what's, what's, what are we doing? Then which, how can we make this a better biomarker? Well, we know that one of the challenges might be the assays, that there are different antibodies used. Although 
in the lung cancer field at least, um, our international associations have actually done a lot of work to try to compare some of those different antibodies and have actually seen relatively similar behavior. I mean, the antibodies all perform fairly well. Um, the Merck antibody has kind of emerged as a more of a standard just because now we have an approval for first-line use of pembrolizumab based on high levels of expression using that antibody. So now that's sort of the standard by which we measure the others, I would say, at least for now. But this diagram really tries to illustrate some of the problems, even if you have a good antibody or even if they're all the same, of why we can sometimes get different answers um, just by how the test is done. So the test is usually done by getting a biopsy and then trying to assess what's going on in those tumor cells that we sample from a patient's body. But you can see these are different scenarios that we might see when we take a sample with a needle. One might be that we see very uniform expression and high level expression, which is what we'd like to have, and then that would give us a good reason to treat a patient with a PD-1 inhibitor. Um, but the, what's more frequently seen or can often be seen is that there can be patchy expression, that some cells express um, PD-1 very intensely, but some cells don't have any expression. And depending on where that needle actually sampled, you might get a completely negative answer, but some cells right next to it might actually have high levels of PD-1 that are going to suppress an immune response, and a PD-1 inhibitor might be actually still very good in this scenario, but we would have missed that from just doing this assay just based on where the needle was in the specimen. Another scenario which is not infrequently seen is that we can see high levels of PD-L1 cells at the edge of the tumor or even immune cells expressing um, PD-L1, but they're not really in the body of the tumor so that when you sample, you're not going to see that. And we also don't exactly know whether this is really the same situation as one of these where the tumor cells within the tumor are really expressing those versus something along the edge of the tumor. Is that Does that have the same likelihood of benefit or not? And um, you know, the answers we get from those biopsies are all different, and it's hard sometimes to know for sure, is this the best marker, is this the best way to assess whether somebody's going to respond or not? So there are other, obviously, efforts that trying to look at other measures for benefit and other kinds of markers, and we know that mutational load or sort of looking at the pattern of genetic change within a tumor can be another good surrogate of um, what we call immunogenicity, or signals to the immune system that I am abnormal, please come attack me. And we know that the overall um, mutational burden can be a marker for benefit from immunotherapies, that if there's a really high level of mutations in the tumor, that that actually can be one way we can get new proteins expressed on the surface of the cancer cells, or even what we call antigen-presenting cells nearby that actually signal immune cells to say, hey, there's something wrong here, there's something abnormal, please come attack. And that might be another way to really um, get a marker for signaling to the immune system. So high levels of PDL1 may be one way, but a high mutational load may be another way to signal um, uh, the immune system that this should be somewhere where you can come and attack. The problem is, is that what we know so far doesn't necessarily suggest that a high mutational load is a better biomarker than high levels of PDL1. It might be more reliable in the way that we test for it, meaning we don't get different answers depending on where you sample within the tumor. Um, but uh, for patients with a low mutational load, there can still be a low chance of benefit. So we still haven't gotten a black and white answer as to um, where we can tell an individual patient, yes or no, this is definitely going to work or it definitely isn't. So we're still searching for some of those answers. Um, one thing we know, sorry, just to go back to this for one moment, is that um, for patients who have uh, cancers that are highly linked to smoking in non-small cell lung cancer, um, they often have a higher mutational burden or higher mu mu antigen load. And we worry that one of the reasons that we see that some patients who are non-smokers are not getting as much chance of benefit of pdl one therapies, that we don't see the same response rates amongst those patients. It might be related to their mutational load. I don't think that's the entire answer, though, because we know that small cell lung cancers also have high mutational loads and don't necessarily have the same chance of response of, as non-small cell lung cancers. So I don't think that there's a simple answer and a simple biomarker that we found for every patient yet. So one of the you know questions beyond just sort of what's the best biomarker is, if we know that um, immunotherapies don't work for everybody, 
But we know that there are different ways to um, change the immune mi microenvironment around a tumor, that, that pd one is a dynamic biomarker, um, that maybe there are ways to make other patients cancers who are not likely to benefit more, quote, immunogenic, meaning boost their signal to the immune system to say, well, hey, now I can, I can give you other therapies or do other things that might make immunotherapies more likely to work. I mentioned that pd one can exchange with exposure to other therapies, can change over time, and it might change even with um, changes that happen between a primary cancer changing to a metastatic cancer and traveling to other places in the body. So there has, there has long been thought that some therapies that we have used for a long time to treat cancer can potentially make a cancer more immunogenic. So radiation, um, we know can create local inflammation, which can maybe signal a, a better immune response. Surgery can do the same thing. Even chemotherapies are thought to, by killing cancer cells, expose antigens or expose novel proteins that are not normal to signal to, can to the immune system that, hey, this is something abnormal going on here. Maybe that's a way to boost the immune response. And there are other drugs, too, that are still in current development, such as histone deacetylase inhibitors or HDAC inhibitors, which are drugs that can affect the gene expression profile or what genes are turned on in a cell and may, again, sort of activate more abnormal um, things that are not normally expressed to say, hey, there's something abnormal going on here. Please come attack me. So these are ways which we might combine with immunotherapies to maybe boost or enhance an immune response for patients who may not um, uh, be more predisposed to get a benefit from the beginning. And I think that goes hand in hand with trying to look for better markers to really exclude patients who really aren't going to benefit and shouldn't be exposed to potential serious side effects. So those are all efforts that are going on now in many, many different clinical trials um, uh, going on around the country. I think there are over 1,500 clinical trials of novel immunotherapy combination um, going on in many different cancer types, including lung cancers. One of the ways that we here at NYU and actually around the country in academic medical centers are trying to better understand how to extend that benefit to more patients is by to try to really look better at what's happening in tumors when they're exposed to immunotherapies or when they're exposed to other therapies that it can affect the immune response. And we've now developed ways to actually look at tumors and profile separate out inflammatory cells from tumor cells, understand what T cells might be in the environment there to begin with, and what things change over time with exposure to different therapies. So there's been a lot of efforts now to assess markers of response and resistance to immunotherapies that even if patients get benefit, what changes over time that will make them resistant eventually, and how can we come back in and use other therapies to then boost that immune response again. So that includes sequencing of DNA and RNA in both immune cells and in cancer cells in the tumor environment to look for changes that might happen as a result of exposure to chemotherapy or as a result of exposure to immunotherapy, looking at protein markers other than pdl one that might change with exposure to immunotherapy, and trying to look at the ratio of different types of immune cells that might suggest that there's a more suppressive immune environment versus a more activated immune environment, or how can we modulate that to change that? And we're also using a lot of cell culture and mouth models to understand changes in response to different therapies as well. So there are a lot of efforts now directed towards how can we broaden what we, the signal of ep efficacy that we've seen, how can we make it more broad so that it actually has a benefit for every patient and so that benefit can be long-term for every patient. So this is a diagram, you know, taken from uh, somebody else's review, but I think it illustrates well the issues that we have uh, faced in lung cancer, where we've come and where we still have to go. One of the therapies that we've used for a long time in lung cancer that have been very promising, but only for small subgroups, are called targeted therapies. And these are drugs like EGFR inhibitors for patients with EGFR mutations or ALK inhibitors for patients with ALK rearrangements. And for that small subset of patients, when we know that survival decreases over time with cancer because the therapies um, ultimately don't cure cancer, we can extend the duration of benefit for patients with targeted therapies, but just for that small subset who have that target. And for those patients, it is actually more of a all or nothing. If you have that mutation, you can get benefit. And if you don't, those drugs are not beneficial. But that extension really just shifts the curve that over time people develop resistance to those therapies and the cancer can get worse and kill people over time. Um, they don't really result in long-term cures. 
the glimmer of hope that we've really seen with immunotherapy is not that we've seen, not just that we've seen patients get shrinkage of their tumors and maybe up to 20% of overall patients, but that for some patients, there's this what we call a tail of the curve, which means that some patients just really never get worse and they have long lived responses. Like you, when you develop immunity to an infection, that you have a long lived immunity that you can really not get infected by that kind of um, pathogen or bacteria or something again, that you really, your immune system has basically mounted a defense that will be a permanent defense. Um, you know, what we've, we've seen that happen for some patients, but by no means the majority. What we'd like to do with better understanding of how we can get better biomarkers, but also how we can better combine therapies to extend that benefit to more patients is not only improve the total number of patients to get shrinkage of their cancer and better benefit initially, but also raise that bar of how the number of patients that get long-term durable benefits and keep cancer under control for years, maybe forever. That, that we don't know yet, but that's certainly our goal. And I think we're in a whole new era of being able to achieve that goal with the tools we now have, this new backbone of PD-1 inhibitors and PD-L1 inhibitors has served to sort of give us a new basis on which to build off of and hopefully really make long-term differences that we haven't been able to do in the past with both chemotherapies or even with targeted therapies. Um, so, you know, that's, and this is just sort of, again, in writing some of what I alluded to, but a lot of the ongoing trials now are combining pd one inhibitors with other immune modulators. One of the ones that's furthest along in lung cancer and has actually been approved in melanoma is a combining PDL1 or PD1 inhibitors with CTLA4 inhibitors. This is another kind of immunosuppressive um, marker on immune cells in the microenvironment that can be blocked with a drug and allow for activation of T cells. And they, they work in different ways in PD1 inhibitors, but together they can be synergistic. And in melanoma, at least, when you combine those two therapies, they can be more effective than PD1 inhibitors alone. We are, we're still doing clinical trials of that kind of combination in lung cancer, but we've also seen very promising results with that combination in lung cancer as well. We're also trying to combine PD-L1 inhibitors with chemotherapy and with radiation, and I um, helped lead a, a large-scale trial of uh, combining standard chemotherapy with PD-1 inhibitor with pembrolizumab, where we saw a much greater overall uh, response, especially among high PDL1 expressors, and we saw much dur more durable benefit, although we haven't seen yet, because the study is still ongoing, whether that translates into better long term overall survival. But there's now a phase three large scale trial going on to try to see if that's the case. And maybe, especially for patients who don't have high levels of PDL1 expression, that might be a way to get that benefit of immunotherapy to a broader group of patients. The other area that I think is very exciting is combining PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors with vaccines. So vaccines have been studied in cancer for many years, and um, there have been a lot of excitement about vaccines, about that potential to get an immune response just like you would it against an infection, and a lot um, less results at the end of the day than we would have liked, meaning we've tried vaccines without a lot of data for long-term benefit for large groups of patients. And one of the reasons that we now think maybe that we haven't seen the benefit that we would have hoped is that <clears throat> PDL1 may explain part of the reasons that vaccines are not effective, that by injecting into your bloodstream a vaccine therapy, maybe you can, we can find um, antigen-specific T cells that get generated as a result of exposure to that vaccine in your blood, but maybe at the level of the tumor in that microenvironment around the tumor, that isn't good enough because there are other suppressive signals there like this PDL1. So maybe if we now combine a PDL1 inhibitor or PD1 inhibitor to block that immunosuppression at the level of the tumor, maybe now we can have a whole new threshold for vaccines to really attack and be effective at controlling cancer cell growth. And that's the basis of a lot of ongoing trials, both here at NYU and elsewhere. Um, so there are obviously a lot of areas of uncertainty still. Um, toxicity is still a big one, even though these are not drugs that have lots of um, side effects like chemotherapies do. For some patients, they can have life-threatening side effects. So we, we really want to try to minimize that if at all possible. And with combination therapies, we risk actually worsening those kinds of things. So we don't still know the optimal duration of these therapies to minimize risk, and we don't know how we can schedule or dose of therapies to minimize risk, but that's an active area of research in lung cancer, specifically within trying to target, combine 
drugs like PD-1 inhibitors and CTLA-4 inhibitors, how do we change the doses, change the schedules of those to minimize the toxicities? And we have seen that we're able to do that in early phase trials. And hopefully those are the kinds of schedules that will go forward into larger scale trials as well. Is pneumonitis a special concern for lung cancer because of patients having underlying potential cancer within the lungs that can put them more at risk? They're also at risk potentially because of prior radiation to the lungs or prior surgery to the lungs or other kinds of lung conditions like COPD, which might make them at special risk. So I think that's a very particular concern for those of us in developing lung, lung cancer therapy specifically is how to minimize the chance of pneumonitis, how to protect people better, and maybe keep patients away from these therapies who really have are at too high risk for having bad outcomes and really try to minimize their exposure to these therapies. Autoimmune conditions have also often thought to be a contraindication, but the more we use these drugs, the more we see that that may be able to be combined in, the, in certain settings, but we have to do more studies to, I think, make sure that that can be done safely. And there are also potential risks with combinations with chemotherapy or there are other immunotherapies. So this is a patient of mine, actually, who was treated with um, both chemotherapy and pembrolizumab, and after one dose developed a very, very severe rash such that we couldn't actually give him any more treatments for several months afterwards. Fortunately, he had a response to the initial combination that did last several months, um, but the rash was thought ultimately to be a, a, a result of probably a combination of both um, the immunotherapy enhancing a side effect that was a result of this chemotherapy, pemetrexid, um, uh, causing reactivation of sun damage. So there are things that we still need to learn and we do need to be cautious going forward because we do want to always do, we always want to be focused on helping people and, and really minimizing the chance of harm. But we've certainly seen really extremely exciting things with PD-1 therapy that they can have long-term benefit for patients. And our goal now is to sort of really maximize the use of those therapies. For a subset of patients, we've seen that PD-1 inhibition can replace chemotherapy as a treatment of choice and hopefully lead to long-term benefits. We still haven't seen because it's, we don't know yet how long that benefit can last, um, and time will tell us that for sure. We hope that combination immunotherapy strategies will expand the pool of patients that can be that can benefit from these. But again, we have to use caution going forward. We do want to keep people safe. Um, and I will stop there, and I'm happy to take questions. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gandhi. I, th it's just so exciting to see how much progress there has been made in discovery of new treatments, especially immunotherapies, in treating uh, what for many decades um, has been a very deadly disease. And um, I think, though, it's important to underscore the point that you made, um, that the data is showing that you know it's, it's not benefiting all patients and uh, may not benefit all patients, um, at least uh, in the way things are going currently. So it's wonderful to see so many new avenues of exploration. There's still a ton of research that's going on. Um, it, you know, we're not there yet. This isn't a home run, uh, but there's very, very promising and encouraging uh, results that we've seen to date. So I really appreciate that you walked us through a lot of that in a very excellent uh, presentation um, that I know many will find very helpful. So I would just like to take a moment to remind everyone who's watching that you can submit questions to Dr. Gandhi um, by using the Q&A pod on your screen. Um, we have gotten a number of questions. Some of those you've already addressed in your presentation, uh, Dr. Gandhi, uh, which is wonderful. So I will try to work through as many of those as possible. I think the first one um, that we've received uh, a number of times is um, how or whether or when a patient should have his or her tumors biopsied and typed for those mutations or those uh, potential biomarker expression levels, is this part of the standard treatment now? When someone comes in and they present with lung cancer, is one of the first things that doctors do is take a sample and study it at the molecular level to determine which therapies may be most beneficial for that patient? Yes, yeah, so that's a very good question, and it's something that is becoming a standard of care from the very first time we meet a patient. So. Historically, and it took actually years for some of these genetic mutations to be tested up front, such as EGFR and ALK, but we know when we know that a drug can make a difference in the very first treatment we give a patient, then we know it's essential to treat before we do any to test, excuse me, before we do anything else. 
So for instance, EGFR and ALK testing is part of our standard of care from the first time we make a diagnosis of cancer, mm -hmm. of, the, of non small cell lung cancer in a patient with lung adenocarcinoma. And it's really only within the last month that we got the results of the study showing that pembrolizumab for patients with high levels of PL1 expression is the first line treatment of choice. But what that means practically is that we need to be testing each and every lung cancer patient up front from the time they have a diagnosis for PD-L1 expression so that we can know if that's the best first line treatment option for them. So that is rapidly becoming a standard of care. And many of us at larger centers were already doing that, but now that has to spread widely into the community and that is a standard of care. It's recommended by our national guidelines. Every physician, every oncologist's office, every pathologist should be testing for pd one at the time of diagnosis of lung cancer because that really can help determine what's the best treatment up front. So that, that seems like that may be something that's ad adopted very quickly at the major cancer treatment centers. Uh, what about at the community oncologist level? Does a community oncologist know and do they, do they see these advisories and, and act accordingly? So our hope is that they do. And yes, I would say community oncologists are guided um, in large part by national guidelines, which are set by groups that are often made up of um, oncologists from major cancer centers. Mm -hmm. But the good thing is, is that we try to react very quickly to new data. So the data from this trial that I mentioned of pembrolizumab came out actually um, on October 10th or October 9th, I think. Uh, it was published the same day it was presented, and the guidelines were changed that week. So that is part of our national guidelines that all patients should be tested upfront for PDL1 expression so that if they are a candidate for benefit from pembrolizumab, meaning if they have high levels of PDL1 expression, that that should be their first treatment that's given. So my hope is that it will be a widespread in adoption. There certainly are the mechanisms in place to do that. Although at many major cancer centers we test within our own pathology laboratories, um, there is certainly, um, even if a community hospital is not doing that, there are established companies throughout the U.S. that do this kind of testing, and that has been available actually since the approval of these drugs even in the second line, so over the last year. So there are widespread and easy ways to do this very quickly within a matter of days. You mentioned that there was um, some uh, variations in the assays or the, the tests that are used to determine levels of expression of PDL1. Um, is there any, and you said groups are working together to try to standardize this, and I've seen that um, going from trial to trial or from company to company, uh, they do use different criteria to determine uh, whether someone registers as positive or not. Um, are we getting close to having kind of a, a standard that um, everyone can adopt? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And if it weren't for that data with pembrolizumab in the first line, I would still, I would say we would still might be kind of far away from that because, in fact, one of the other drugs that's been in development, atezolizumab from Genentech, where they actually did very careful analysis of not only pd one expression on tumor cells, but also of local immune cells in the microenvironment. And in their initial study suggested that those were very important, actually, for predicting benefit. They actually also recently came out with a large-scale study that resulted in approval of this drug in the second line. And although there was a much better chance of response for high levels of expression, just like we see with pembrolizumab, there was also sort of benefit across the board. And so that drug actually got approved in the second line without any testing requirement. But functionally, what's happened because of this pembrolizumab data in the first line is that we will see widespread testing of patients from the first time they get diagnosed. So I think that's going to color how we use the drugs overall, all of them. And for at least for right now, because that data is linked to pembrolizumab and we used the specific antibody that was used in those trials called 22C3, I would say that for right now, that is a de facto standard. Now, how long that will be a standard, I think, remains to be seen because there are many ongoing trials of other agents in the first line and also combination therapies in the first line, which might change that. We're also obviously looking at other biomarkers, such as neoantigen or mutational burden or even other things, signatures of different protein expression, a variety of things. So I think that what's going to be our ultimate biomarker is still a moving target, but but right now, as of today, I would say PDL1 testing um, should be done for all patients. Um, and if there isn't an established test in, in within a hospital, then that might be reasonable to start with that 22C3 antibody assay. 
If there is an established test within a hospital, however, you know, the data that we have from our cooperative group, from our Lung Cancer Consortium, the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer, has suggested that many of the antibodies are quite similar in predicting um, in, in how they in how they um, stain for PDL1 and that they actually correlate with each other fairly well. In fact, the one outlier was the antibody used in the Genentech assay, um, but the others, um, some of which are actually commercial antibodies from cell signaling, as well as some that are used um, for testing in nivolumab, mm -hmm. um, are actually quite similar to the two to the antibody assay. So I wouldn't suggest, and I don't think that other hospitals that have established assays will change those assays at this point in time. We're still trying to compare and we're still trying to get more data, again, about the long-term best biomarker. Um, so when you when you say first line or preferred uh, first line therapy, um, just to be clear to those who are watching, that means that in a head to head trial, either with uh, standard of care or historical data on the standard of care, the immunotherapy performed better in terms of patient responses, and therefore uh, that's the basis for the approval as a first line treatment. Is uh, as a first line approved treatment. Um, is this a, a decision a patient needs to make with a doctor, or is this something doctors are comfortable now or becoming increasingly comfortable and knowledgeable about how these immunotherapies work, that they would automatically give it to the patient as a first line if they meet all the criteria around expression levels? Yeah, well, I think that there is, um, you know, there's a huge level of excitement and hope about these types of drugs, both among patients, but also people who take care of them, like the doctors who take care of them. So I think that we've all been sort of hanging on edge about these data and are quite, um, I hope most of us are quite well aware of them and will implement them for all of our patients. So to me, um, this sort of spurred me on, although I've been actually talking to our, my pathologist for years at different institutions I've worked at to try to get this testing done broadly now I have the data to say this has to be done and this has to be done today broadly and I need to treat my patients today based on this result. Mm -hmm. I think that there are still opportunities, particularly at larger academic medical centers, for ongoing clinical trials in the first line of combination immunotherapies and those are still happening. Um, so for patients uh, who are first diagnosed with lung cancer, that can be one part of the decision and clinical trials may be another factor. But outside of a clinical trial, if a patient has high level of pdl one expression, then pembrolizumab, as of today, should be the treatment of choice. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about non-small cell lung cancer. That's kind of where we've seen um, the FDA approvals. What about uh, in small cell lung cancer, mesothelioma, or other types of lung? Lung cancer is a very broad umbrella term. Um, it so is. And, and, and often I will say, because non-small cell lung cancer represents about 80% of lung cancer, we often focus on that, but it's a very important question. And I think I sort of alluded to the fact that small cell lung cancer is also highly associated with smoking, is a cancer type which is known to have a high mutational burden, and where we've actually been very excited to use immunotherapies, but haven't necessarily, at least in early data, seen as impressive results. And that's something that's very close to my heart because that's my area of research is in small cell lung cancer and trying to understand immunotherapies. Um, what we have seen is that the response rates are overall somewhat lower, meaning that um, with nivolumab, which has been studied probably most extensively in that setting, the response rates are more on the order of 10%. Mm -hmm. um, for patients who are selected by pd one uh, in a pembrolizumab trial, the response rate was higher. But what we know about um, pd one and small cell lung cancers is it's probably not the same as in non-small cell lung cancer. So, Unlike non-small cell lung cancer, where about a third of patients have high levels of expression of PDL1, we actually very rarely see high levels of expression of PDL1 in small cell lung cancer. We can sometimes see very low levels of expression, more commonly no expression, but unlike small cell lung cancer, we do see a lot of um, cancers with where the immune cells in the um, cancer environment express PDL1. And that's still an active area of research. There's actually limited published data about this, but we don't know yet whether th those are the cells that might drive the response or not, or whether there's some other biomarker altogether. We have seen that combination immunotherapy, so combination of nivolumab, a PD1 inhibitor, and ipilimumab, a CTLA4 inhibitor, can have better activity in small cell lung cancer. And there the response rates might be 
it's on the order of 20, 30%, um, which is much more encouraging. But again, I think we need more data in that cancer type to really know who are the patients that should get therapy, what's the biomarker there that's really going to be helpful to us in identifying patients, and what's the right combination of therapies. And those are still active areas of study. One of the studies that I'm doing actually is to try to understand particularly for small cell lung cancer, where we know that chemotherapy and radiation are important therapies that can have a big benefit up front but just doesn't last, is can we use those to actually activate an immune response? And we're doing a study combining and sequencing chemotherapy, radiation, and pembrolizumab to try to see if we can maximize or boost the potential for our immune responses in that cancer. Mesothelioma, on the other hand, is a cancer type where we've actually seen quite high levels of expression of pd one on the order of about 40% of patients expressing relatively high levels. So there, we're actually very hopeful for benefit from um, uh, immunotherapies, and there's early data still. So part of the difficulty with mesothelioma is it's a rare cancer type, so we can't easily do large-scale trials the way we can in non-small cell lung cancer. But we have seen encouraging results so far, particularly with PD-1 inhibitors as opposed to PL-1 inhibitors, where we've seen quite pro promising response rates and now, now those are being studied as first-line treatments and in combination with chemotherapy and mesothelioma as well. So we're very hopeful about potential there also. Wonderful. Um, last question, unfortunately, we're, we're almost out of time. Um, let's talk a little bit more about clinical trials. Um, we've, we've focused largely on um, you know, drugs that have been approved now. Um, but uh, just a, a question, if as there are at least one immunotherapy that's now approved as first-line treatment, could someone, could a patient still opt to enroll in a clinical trial um, where they would receive that as, you know, the standard of care, but in conjunction with that might receive an experimental therapy or uh, receive another type of therapy like you've discussed, like uh, targeted therapy or radiation therapy? Is that advisable? Um, should the person not opt for a clinical trial, just go with the, the first-line monotherapy, or, or what are the options that patients have? Well, it's a very good question, and one that's going to be rapidly evolving and changing, because it's really only within the last month that immunotherapy has become a standard of care option for first-line therapy. So there have, been, there have been now for some time, for the past couple of years, many ongoing studies that combine PD-1 inhibitors with maybe another novel agent and histone deacetylase inhibitor or a vaccine therapy or something else to try to see if we can get better responses. And I think what we'll see is that a lot of the criteria for entry into those trials might be modified slightly to allow for patients who have not had prior chemotherapy necessarily. Um, because for a subset of patients, pr prior chemotherapy is not the first line option of choice anymore. Um, so there are also ongoing trials though, obviously, and more trials, actually, to try to understand for patients who have had prior immunotherapies, um, are there new combinations that could actually overcome resistance if patients have progressed on those initial, chemo initial immunotherapies? And that's a very active area of research of can these combinations actually overcome resistance? And there are many ongoing trials for which that's exactly the population that is eligible for that trial, patients who have actually already had a prior immunotherapy, but the cancer has grown despite that, or... Um, maybe even didn't respond to that. Um, so that's, a very, that's another scenario where we're testing clinical trials. It's fair to say, though, that clinical trials are something where it's our only way of getting rigorous, clear information about how well a drug or a combination of drugs is likely to work. So we do have to really adhere to the context of the clinical trial, meaning, meaning we don't mix and match standard therapies and clinical trials, because then we really don't get answers about what's likely to be a more effective therapy. And at the end of the day, we want to get those answers as quickly as we can. If there's uh, one piece of advice uh, that you could give to patients and caregivers, um, what would it be? Um, I would say I think that a lot of patients and caregivers have heard already about these therapies and are very excited about them. And I would say it's a very important thing to be excited about. Talk to your doctor about it because there is very rapid, there are very rapid changing, changes happening within the field. So if, for instance, you're a newly diagnosed patient and that's not a topic of conversation at that first visit, talk to your doctor about it because it should be a topic of conversation. But I would also encourage you to be mindful of that this is a dialogue and the doctor really will probably, will hopefully guide you 
in understanding whether this is a good option or not. But these are not black and white scenarios yet. They're not the right answer for everybody. And we don't want to waste time with therapies that can either be harmful to a patient or ineffective. So talking to your doctor is the best way to sort of sort out amongst the different therapies that do exist, where do I have the best chance? And if the immunotherapy isn't the best chance for me right now, how, what other the trial options or where can, down the road, can I make it a good option? Our hope is that, you know, in, in treating cancer, we, I often like to say, you know, we don't cure a lot of lung cancer, especially in metastatic lung cancer, but we don't cure a lot of things in medicine. We don't cure diabetes. We don't cure heart disease. We don't cure high blood pressure, but we have really effective therapies. And if one stops working, we have really good tools to bring in at the next step. And that's where I think we're doing much better in cancer and heading towards being that way. Now we have better tools. We have better therapies. So that if this isn't the right answer now, this may be the back pocket option for later. Our goal is a long road ahead for every single individual patient. And we want to have tools for now and tools for later. And it's a matter of figuring out how to best order those tools to get the maximum benefit for the maximum time. That's that's wonderful. And it's, it's fantastic that um, there are individuals such as yourself who are dedicated to this and doing this really intense but very important work. So thank you so much for your dedication to uh, lung cancer patients. Um, as I said, that's all the time that we have for today's webinar. Very excellent discussion, great questions. Sorry that we could not get to them all today. Um, stay tuned for future webinars on lung cancer. Perhaps we can uh, continue the conversation. Um, so with that, I'd like to remind everyone that the webinar has been recorded and will be made available on the Cancer Research Institute website, cancerresearch.org uh, forward slash webinars, and also on our YouTube channel. There was a lot of great information presented here today, so you may want to go back over and just make sure you caught everything. I'd like to thank our generous sponsors who've made today's webinar possible, including Genentech and LabAnswer and its employees as well as AbbVie, Celdex Therapeutics, NewLink Genetics, and Regeneron. If you'd like to learn more about immunotherapy for lung cancer or any other type of cancer, uh, I strongly encourage you to check out our website at theanswertocancer.org, which provides information on a number of tumor types um, and the basics of immunotherapy and can also connect you to clinical trials and other resources for patients and caregivers. Once again, cancerresearch.org forward slash webinars to see this and other webinars. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Gandhi. And until next time, goodbye.